Before we start the show, I just wanted to remind people that we have a subscription service called Politics Girl Premium, and without it, it would be impossible to keep this show going as an independent source of information. So if you enjoy our content and think we offer something worthwhile, please consider signing up to be part of the Politics Girl Premium family. You'll get access to ad-free episodes of all the podcasts, including the complete back catalog, direct emails of all the rants, discounted merchandise, quarterly Q&As, and the opportunity for in-person meet and greets. At the end of the day, it is really expensive to not sell out, but with your support, it can continue to be possible. Of course, if it's not in your budget, I understand, and you will always have access to everything I produce for free. But if you can help, it would make such a tremendous difference to keeping this work going. To subscribe, go to the link in the show notes or go to politicsgirl.com slash premium to check out our various plans or to simply make a donation. Thank you for caring enough about democracy to be here. I literally couldn't do this work without you. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. So based on how the Republican primary is going, it really looks like the Republican Party is all in on running a criminal rapist with 91 felony charges as their candidate. And as horrifying as that is, and as disappointing as it feels to be an American knowing that, the way our system is set up, even with such an unsuitable candidate, this party could still win the highest office in the land. There's actually no rule that says a president can't be president from prison. Except we all know that if Donald Trump becomes president again, he won't be in prison. In fact, it would be the end of our rule of law as we know it. We'll move into a future where some people will be above the law and it just won't be any of us. We will have unleashed a dictator, backed by the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society and every corrupt right-wing billionaire in this country, to usher in some form of autocratic Christian nationalism where the federal government answers solely to the president. Even if, by some miracle, Donald Trump isn't the candidate and we avoid his lawless tirade of retribution, Nikki Haley is all in for Project 2025, which, if you heard our top of year show, is a detailed strategic playbook that outlines how to destroy the federal government as we know it. So the bottom line here is, if these people get power, we are in major trouble. So it has never been more essential that we fight back with deliberation and purpose. The 2024 election comes down to democracy itself. The Republican Party has shown us exactly who they are, who they really represent, and what values they truly stand for. So unless you want to live in a white supremacist Christian patriarchal society run by corrupt billionaires and their bought and paid for politicians who don't believe in the rule of law, then you want to be working overtime to defeat these people every chance you get. We have to win, and we have to win big. To talk about how to do that, my guest today is Yasmin Raji, the executive director of Swing Left, the national organization that has become one of the largest drivers of grassroots volunteers and donors across the country. Before joining Swing Left, Yasmin served in the Biden-Harris administration as a senior advisory at the Treasury Department, and prior to that as the national political director at Planned Parenthood Action Fund, overseeing candidate endorsements, PAC activity, national political partnerships, and coordinated campaign efforts. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where she won the Robert F. Kennedy Award in Excellence in Public Service, Yasmin is a California native who currently lives in D.C. with her husband and son and soon-to-be new baby. And fun fact, she also speaks English, Spanish, French, and Persian. She is the real deal and the kind of person you want at the helm of an effective organization like Swing Left. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, Executive Director for Swing Left, Yasmin Raji. Welcome back, Yasmin. Thank you so much. It's great to see you again. Happy New Year. Oh, happy New Year. If I'm allowed to say that this late in January. We are allowed (laughs) to say that this late in January. I think right through January, we are allowed to say that. I had this conversation with someone the other day and they were like, can I still say that? I was like, absolutely. And then we'll just go right into Valentine's Day. We'll be like, happy Valentine's Day. (laughs) Well, thanks for coming. You know, I'm such a huge fan of Swing Left. I really love how focused you guys have been on making sure that the money people donate and the time that they give really goes to the right and most effective, honestly, places. I like that you care about the security of people's information and you've taken all those extra steps to make sure that if people put their time or they put their money with you, that it's really going to actually make a difference. And I just really want to honestly thank you guys for what you do. 
Well, thank you. And thanks for all that you do. Uh, I mean, the people that you reach with your platform, uh, we were just chatting before this podcast. Uh, what we love about them is that they are uh, action-oriented people, which is exactly uh, why we feel like kindred spirits with you. Our community is also action-oriented, and uh, we know that we need a lot of action to win all the things that are on the line. So uh, thanks for what you do every day. Yeah, of course. And boy, is there a lot on the line, right? Here we are at, like we said, the top of 2024 with mega extremism on like a rocket ship to the freaking moon. Every day it's something new, some other horrible thing that's coming down the pipeline. And the GOP just seem hell bent on stripping away so many of our fundamental rights and freedoms that we clearly can't waste a single second or dollar of our money messing around, right? We need to be out there right. defending our democracy and just tell me then, like, what is Swing Left focusing on in this make it or break it year? What is your focus right now? You said it exactly. Our kind of our motto for the year is there is no time or money to waste. There's not just so much on the line, but it's also we're in such a different moment politically than where we were in 2018, where we were in 2020. We've all been at this for a while. Some folks are tired. Some folks are sort of losing their sense of self about being agents of change. And a whole lot of folks have just been grinding hard with their sort of, you know, the focus of their time and their money going toward huge change uh, for year after year after year. We need them to stay at it. So that's kind of that's our kind of overall uh, lens. We've got to you know make sure our time and money is going toward winning back a federal trifecta and toward to continuing to build power in the states. And you know this, you talk about this all the time, but we've got to be able to walk and chew gum. We can't have Joe Biden in the White House without partners in the Senate and the House. And we also know what happens in places like North Carolina when you don't have, if, you, if we didn't have a Democratic governor in North Carolina, we'd have some of the most regressive anti-abortion laws in the country there. So we've got to also be uh, investing in the states. So that's the kind of those are the headlines. And of course, happy to talk about uh, more of the ways that people can plug in. Uh, but we need folks to start now. I mean, it's really the clock is ticking fast uh, between now and Election Day, and we have no time to waste. No, zero time to waste. OK, so let's just say uh, the the goal here is to engage in presidential swing state elections, essentially, to make sure that those states go Biden-Harris. Because at the end of the day, as much as as we all want to think our votes are the most important and we want to be voting in every single state, it does come down to a handful of people in a handful of states making these decisions because of the Electoral College. And until we can do something about that, that's just the fact of the matter. Exactly. Then we have to hold, as you said, the Democratic majority in the Senate, which is a tough mat mm -hmm. for Democrats. So it's essential that we hold the seats in places like Montana and Ohio and right. Michigan and Arizona and Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, which has been just all mm -hmm. over the place this year, and Nevada. These are all up. And the Republicans think they can flip a lot of these seats. And if the Republicans get back in control in the Senate, we are in so much trouble. And then, of course, we have to win back the U.S. House, right? And what's happening there under Mike Johnson right now is a travesty. And so we have to be supporting candidates that are running in flippable districts and then kind of honing in on those who are most vulnerable incumbents. I mean, we almost had a district flip right away with Lauren Boebert in Colorado, but I think she's now changing districts <laughs> because she knew she was going to get whooped. Exactly, um, exactly. And then, as you said, you know, Thank goodness, it seems like you guys are also really focused on breaking up these horrible GOP trifectas in the states, like we're talking about right. down in Carolinas. And the power structures there that have allowed the Republicans to truly disenfranchise voters through legislation and gerrymandering and actually just strip them of their rights with very little ability, like in North Carolina now, to have the people even fight back. They can't even vote their way out of some of these problems now. Right. Um, what's going on? with rights in Texas. I mean, those people are losing their rights left, right, and center. As we were saying, initially, Swing Left was working primarily on congressional swing districts, but with the success of your movement, it really means that you can get more volunteers, more donors, and you're kind of making more races competitive. Am, am I right in thinking that you've been able to expand your strategic reach uh, and research to include the state and state legislative races and even some governorships in the past couple of years? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, when we started in 2018, uh, the organization was founded as a response to the election of Donald Trump. We launched the day after his inauguration. And uh, our founders looked around and said, you know, we, we know we need people have time. They've got money. They're not sure where to channel it. 
And the first line of defense, as you well remember in 2018, was we had to win back the House as a check on Donald Trump. And when we ended that cycle, um, and I think we've talked about this before, but it was just an amazingly inspirational cycle of Swing Left ended up having more volunteers, uh, you know, directly volunteering for campaigns than any other organization out there, which was amazing in general, but also particularly amazing for a really new organization. And when we looked at the end of the cycle and said, you know, is our mission really about the House? Or is our mission about having the power to be able to fight back against Donald Trump and what Donald Trump represents, which is that MAGA extremism that has completely taken over the entire Republican Party? And we opted for the latter, which really meant that in 2020, we needed to literally defeat Donald Trump. We had to make sure that we were electing Joe Biden. So that meant we had to take on the presidential. And also, we know, as you well said, If we don't have power in the Senate, even with the House and with the presidential, we lose out on things like judicial nominations. We lose out on the ability to get all the amazing things done that then Speaker Nancy Pelosi, soon to be Speaker Hakeem Jeffries, have ready to go. And so 2020, we expanded those levels of the ballot. And we recognize that even if we've got that federal trifecta of the presidency, the Senate and the House, If we continue to fall behind in the states, which, you know, progressives have been completely underinvesting in the states for a generation, this has been a real issue. And state legislatures are so much more right wing and extreme than the people who live in their states that we had to start also doing that investment. So 2020 is when, as you rightly said, we expanded those levels of the ballot. And 2020 was a really weird cycle, right? So we had huge amounts of activity. But that activity was all online because we all were stuck at home, right? We weren't out knocking on doors, et cetera. So we had a huge infusion of engagement, but it looked and felt so different uh, from 2018 for all of the kind of external factors that we saw. But we raised, we ended up raising $26 million in small dollar contributions for candidates at all those levels of the ballot. And I think something that we learned from that and then wrote uh, it was 21 million letters to uh, to voters who were uh, unlikely to vote and had huge impacts on their likeliness of turning out. With all of that said, though, I think what we really observed was that we had built this community of people who were engaged around the House in 2018. An organization we merged together with called Flippable had done the same thing on the state side. And as we engage with folks uh, over the 2020 cycle, as we continue to do now, It's not that folks are sort of like, I only care about this level of government. Folks care about progress in our country. They're like, maybe I have half an hour a week. Maybe I have a hundred bucks, whatever it is. I want it to go where it's going to make change. And I need not, you know, a total uh, 101 on government, but I need some guidance of, is this candidate who's emailing me legit? Is this you know, random state legislature, something that matters. And so being able to talk about all those levels, excuse me, levels of government in one, and also letting people walk and chew gum of here's how I'm investing in our long-term democracy through the states. Here's how I'm investing in the short-term need of getting Donald Trump way the hell out of office in 2020 and now keeping him out of office in 24. That's been sort of a lot of our learning and, uh, and it's been really inspiring to see people, uh, again, be able to think short term and long term at the same time. And it's essential to think short term and long term at the same time. I mean, you were mentioning like we are always behind as Democrats on the long term planning and totally. the Republicans have been so successful and the conservative movement has been so successful at doing really long term planning. It's how we we talk about it all the time. It's how Roe versus Wade got overturned. It's how our courts got taken over. It's it's totally. how we're now looking at the reversal of so many um companies like the EPA and this kind of thing and what they can do and not do. This is a long-term conservative plan to pull us back, not just to before civil yeah. rights, but like to for workers' rights. You know what I mean? Like before women had any rights, they would like to pull us totally. all the way back to like the Gilded Age where certain people could treat their workers however they wanted and women however they wanted and minorities however they wanted. And they made money and money was really the, the whole point, right? But I've always been so impressed with how specific swing left can be with your research to make sure that Mm -hmm. you're putting people's money and time exactly in the right place. So how do you identify the races that are going to determine the balance of power so you know where to put that money and volunteers to make the best impact? 
I think we like any organization that's focused on competitive races, we look at the numbers first and foremost. So we see sort of what are the voting patterns you talked about, you know, Lauren Boebert's district, she, you know, she won by just a couple hundred votes. I think it was in the sort of mid 500s. Yeah, it was like 512 or something. Yeah, exactly. Like the math is clear there that we can win that race with more investment and we can win that race with the same candidate who won, who ran last time. So we start with the math. We look at sort of what's competitive, et cetera. Um, and then we really look at what where are the places where we've got people, not necessarily in the district, but adjacent to the district. So swing left, we've got huge pockets of volunteers in places like New York and California. So those competitive races, places like California 13 is a 90 minute drive from my hometown. Uh, that was a race that was in the sort of like 200s of uh, the margin of votes, uh, what Adam Gray lost by last time. And we're going to make sure he wins this time. But we look at, all right, well, we've got a huge volunteer base 90 minutes away from his district. Can we actually help make a difference here? So not just is this a competitive seat, but is this a place where we can really make a difference based on who our people are? And on the money side, is this a place where money will actually help? So it might be that it's a really competitive race, but the candidate has raised so much money in a in a place where it's actually really cheap to go on TV and you know, it's really cheap to to run a great campaign and the marginal dollar is not going to be that high. So we look at all of those factors and I think the the two things that I think are really key, that's not rocket science, right? Plenty of organizations do that and do it really well. I think the key differences are number 1 at Swing Left, the only lens that we are applying is competitiveness. How do we get democratic majorities? And I've worked for amazing organizations throughout my career who have other really important lenses. Like I worked at Planned Parenthood for years. So it's not just how do we get to a majority, but where do candidates stand on this sort of spectrum of perspective on reproductive freedom? So, you know, that and that may motivate some folks much more than majorities is how proactive are they on abortion rights or whatever the case may be. With our lens just being competitiveness, it also means that when we can shift our targets, et cetera, our promise to grassroots donors, our promise to grassroots volunteers is where you're putting your time and money gets us to majorities. You may not be investing in the most charismatic, articulate, inspirational candidate you've ever met in your life. And it doesn't matter because that candidate will be essential to Hakeem Jeffries being speaker, Chuck Schumer being uh, you know Senate majority leader, Joe Biden being president. And that's really what matters. And then the final piece is, and I think this goes to sort of our origin story, is we work really closely with the party committees. We need them to be really successful. If we don't have a successful DNC and DCCC and DLCC and DSCC, that's huge. You know, those are resources that candidates rely on. They rely on them for all sorts of things that they need to win. But those are also institutions that have more constraints than we do because they're bigger, because They've got to work with the internal politics of protecting incumbents, et cetera. That's not good or bad. It just is. And so as an organization that doesn't have those constraints and has that singular lens just on competitiveness, it means that we can also say, you know what? We have this target on our Senate map right now. We don't need to keep prioritizing them. They've got the money that we need. We're taking them off the map. Or we're adding this candidate on who was kind of a long shot early on, but things have really shifted in their district. And so I think that's a it's a level of um, of sort of freedom that we have just based on how we're structured, um, sort of how nimble we are as an organization. And I think that that's really important, not as a replacement for other really key organizations in the ecosystem, but as an added sort of trusted broker where, um, you know, for a lot of folks who don't have a lot of time. They've got a budget. That budget might be small. It might be big. uh, And they just want to know very simply, where do I put my time and my money? We can provide that uh, that service to them. And we're this cycle trying to really further simplify uh, not just how we talk about all of that, but even the technology that we're using. Um, Folks can go now to see our updated fundraising platform, which is simpler than it ever has been so that folks can break their donations up across competitive candidates. And also not get inundated with a million emails from us afterwards. They'll get information afterwards, but they're not going to then get three emails a day saying, 
you're, you know, we need another $5. We need another $5. We need another $5, which I think is also key to a long-term trusting relationship with volunteers and donors who are our partners in the fight and are who will be the solution to that long-term work that uh, that you and I were just talking about. Yeah. And I think the essential thing in that, first of all, is because we all hate those freaking emails. Like, oh, yeah. the sky is falling. <laughs> I know you just sent money. Send more money. Ah, You know, people hate that. They loathe it. Yeah. And, and it's understandable that they loathe it. They want to know, I sent money and it's going to the right place and it's going to help. But you're talking right. about being nimble. And I think that's really important. You're working in cohesion with the bigger companies, the DNCs and the DCCCs and these kind of things. But I've always said, if those guys are like an aircraft carrier, we need helicopters going off the side. We yeah. need speedboats going off the side that are more maneuverable, that can move faster, that can do things. Like if the aircraft carrier is like, we're going this way very slowly, you guys swing left can be like, we're off, you know, we're a helicopter and we're off and here we go and we're moving. And I think that's really essential. So what are the victories for 2024 in your head? What are you focusing on right now? Because I know you've designated something called swing left super states. Tell me a little bit about that. Like we talked about up front, we have to win the presidency, the House, the Senate, and the states. Yes, and all of it. And we can't be coy it. about that. Yeah. We cannot be coy about it. And that can also feel really overwhelming, right? It's if someone's got, they've got a hundred bucks that they want to give. Well, shoot, you just told me I got a multitask. Does that mean I divide up? Like, what am I supposed to do? So um, the way that we are hoping to simplify the way that folks can kind of break down their time and their money is uh, what we're calling our 12 super states. So the math adds up across these. If we win in these 12 states, that is how we get to the trifecta. And that's how we, uh, again, make sure that we're building the right kind of power in the states for our long term uh, investment in our democracy. And what's a little bit weird about this cycle and why, again, the kind of walking and chewing gum is extra important here is a lot of times states like a Pennsylvania or a Michigan Right. These are places that matter for the presidential. There's key, you know, Senate races, House races, state legislative races. It's all in one place. So everyone's talking about Pennsylvania as they should be. We really need to be talking about Pennsylvania. And usually in a presidential year, those are the only places we're talking about. Now, there's eight of those states this year. That includes Pennsylvania. It includes Michigan, includes Arizona. But eight of those what we call nested states. It's nested from the presidential on down. Sort of think about the the kind of uh, Russian nesting dolls, like every single level of the ballot really matters. But if we win in those eight states, when we win those eight states, that's not enough. We still don't get to the math of a trifecta. We win the presidency with those eight states. We don't and get to 270. We don't get the House. We've got to also invest in New York and California. And I think that's really key, particularly, I talk to New Yorkers and Californians every single day who don't yet fully understand just how much they are at the, on the front lines. They've sort of like memorized uh, the numbers for Maricopa County voters for the presidential or Bucks County voters, but they're not thinking about the Central Valley or Orange County or you know all these places that are going to be really key. So New York and California, we've got the eight presidential uh, nested states. We've got those two additional major house states, several really key districts in New York and California. And then we've got, and you mentioned these earlier, two essential additional states for the Senate, and that's Montana and Ohio, where, you know, I would be shocked if Joe Biden spends a dollar in either of those states. They're not on the presidential map. They are states that are turning redder and redder with a big asterisk of, as you well remember, we did a lot of winning in Ohio this year we on uh, reproductive freedom and democracy. So it's not that it's a state tilting redder. It's a state that is tilting toward a, a shrinking electorate of like horrible voter suppression laws. But we have to elect Sherrod Brown in Ohio and John Tester in Montana. If we lose one of those, we don't have a majority, right? So all of that adds up to 12 super states. We're not asking that folks memorize the demographics of the persuadable versus, you know, whatever voters in those states, just focus on those 12. And if someone is more motivated by doing something close to their hometown, they live in New York City, focus on the house in New York City. You don't have to do it. Every person doesn't have to do everything. Collectively, we've got to do it all. Uh, and so we're going to offer people the choices within those 12 states of if you care about, if you don't care about which level of the ballot, you just want your $100 to go spread or your time to be spread, we will choose the adventure for you. And then for folks who really feel more strongly about 
one level of government or a state that they're connected to, et cetera, they'll have that ability. And collectively, we'll make sure that we're winning uh, all 12 of those states. Absolutely. Okay. So let's just like, I just want to go down because you were just mentioning Ohio uh, and Montana. And I just want people to understand these states just because there are These are states that are so essential. These are Senate must hold races. And I want people to understand these states. So Ohio is running their current incumbent, amazing Senator uh, Sherrod Brown. And Republicans think they have this one in the bag. They think they're going to be able to take it from him. But I'd say Ohio special elections this year on changing the Constitution and abortion rights really indicates that that is not the way the voters in those states are actually thinking. And so we need to keep our attention on that state because I think that Sherrod Brown could really still win this and he could pull it out. People like him. And I think it's just like you're saying, Ohio is very voter suppressed. The Republicans have gone over the top trying to make sure people don't vote, can't vote, are misinformed, this kind of thing. So we really do need to be focusing on that state. You were also talking about Montana, and that's a must hold state because that's a state that Trump won in 2016 and 2020. But there's a Democrat in the Senate there named John Tester, who's amazing. He's such a Montana guy. Like, he really understands that state. He's going to speak for the people of Montana. Um, So he absolutely must win again. Again, Republicans think that's an easy flip, and we have to make sure it's not. Then we have to go back to Arizona. So Arizona needs to have the Democrat, Ruben Gallego, beat Big Pharma darling and liar and now independent Kristen Cinema, and also yeah. potentially completely crazy election denying Republican Carrie Lake. That's who's going to be running there. And so we have to make sure Ruben Gallego wins. Michigan, which is a state we are so proud of that is doing so much good work for democracy, has just like this onslaught of amazing women leaders right at the top of the state. Um, Their Senate candidate actually isn't set yet. It's a top target for Republicans to flip. So it's really essential that we get a good candidate there and get behind them. But swing left doesn't give money to primary candidates, but you do collect money in a coffer so that the candidate when determined can just hit the ground running. Is that right? That's exactly right. And I think uh, returning to sort of how noisy and confusing the ecosystem can be, Sometimes I'll get a text from someone and who says, you know, I just got a, a, a call from X candidate in, running in Michigan. They say that they are, you know, they are the, the nominee or they're going to be the nominee or whatever. Do I trust that? Do I give them my money, et cetera? And for some people, they really want to engage in those primaries. They really care about a candidate. They're inspired by them. And that's amazing. A lot of folks are like, I want a majority. I don't really want to get involved in the primary stuff. It's confusing. I don't know that much about them. I'm not from that state. So what we do for the folks who opt into that second category is we offer them the opportunity uh, to give their dollars to what's called a nominee fund. Uh, And that's something that we created in 2018 for the very first time. It's now uh, sort of infiltrated in a great way, the full ecosystem. And what that means is if you want to give today to the whoever ends up being the nominee in Michigan, because we need a really, really strong start to the general election for that critical Michigan Senate race. You could give your 50 bucks today. It'll be held in a bank account on Act Blue. uh, And then the day that there is an official nominee, that money gets released into the bank account of the candidate. And something that I heard um, at a conversation with one of our uh, 2018 House targets who had never heard of Swing Left when she ran uh, in 2018, because we were so new. And she said the day she won her primary, she got this big check in her bank account from the Swing Left nominee fund. She didn't know who we were. She didn't know where that money came from. And she just started sobbing because she was just like, you know, in a primary, and a lot of folks don't think about this, you're so focused on beating your primary opponent You've got to spend all that money that you raise. You've got to you've got a really lean staff. And the day after your primary, you've got a bank empty bank account, two and a half staff members, and now all of a sudden you've got to beat a really tough Republican, who in many cases is self-funded or didn't have a primary. So they've already started talking to the voters that you need to talk to. And so those nominee fund checks are so critical because it gives people that jump start on day one to then hire the people that they need to defeat the Republican, to start doing the message research about sort of what, how do we get those Republican and independent voters that I didn't talk to at all during the primary because I was just trying to turn out the Democratic base. And so that's a great way for people to engage now. And when they go to our website, uh, swingleft.org, 
uh, to give uh, to give whatever they uh, whatever they can afford to different candidates. Uh, they'll see that nominee funds for those places like Michigan are already set up for them. That's perfect. Okay, so then where were we? Nevada. We're at Nevada. Okay, so we need Senator Jackie Rosen to win again. Republicans think this is an easy take for them. But Nevada voters now have a Secretary of State in Cisco Aguilar who really wants to make sure the elections there are fair, unlike the election denier that he ran against who thought only Republicans should win in that state. So I think we have a real chance in Nevada now to really have it be a fair election and to get Jackie Rosen back to the Senate. We need Bob Casey Jr. to win in Pennsylvania. We were talking about Pennsylvania before and how essential it is. And I I think Pennsylvania voters have become well aware, especially through the amazing actions of their governor, Josh Shapiro, over the past year or so, that the Democrats are really working in their best interest in that state. So I I really have a lot of hope for Pennsylvania. And then, of course, we need to keep Tammy Baldwin in her seat uh, in Wisconsin Senate seat. So Wisconsin seems to be going out of their way to just attack democracy at every turn so that there are literally Nazis feeling safe to walk in the streets of Madison, Wisconsin. And I would love to put the Republicans in their place there. The Democrats, especially under the leadership of the amazing Ben Wickler, really have it together for the people there. And I want to reward that lovely state with their continued fair and democratic leadership. So we should also note that, like you said before, a lot of these races, these must-win Senate races, also line up with the battleground states that we have to win to win the presidency. So focusing on them is going to be essential right across the board. You were talking about this new way that donors have to select where their money goes, which I think is amazing because unlike other donation platforms uh, where people just say, okay, all my money goes to this candidate, this way you've already done all the homework for them and you're giving them a specific list of candidates they should be supporting and ones that really, if they put their money there, it's it's a a much higher chance of a win. And then all the money are going to go to these winnable and important, important races. Swing, swing left has always been incredibly specific about where money and people's attention goes. And I think that's really important to highlight because you guys have always really respected the people that done that. And we we talk about it all the time, but I, I think it's really essential. We were talking about it earlier with the spam emails and with the like, please, sky is falling emails. And like, again, I'm just going to text you for the 75th time. I literally had to change my email address. I had to change my email address because I had so, I was like, I can't keep up. I literally have 100,000 unread emails. How could I possibly? I just changed my email address and it was all because of political spam. Once you start giving, then it's like totally. this mental, it's, it becomes crazy and it makes people angry and it shuts them down. And the last thing we need is to have people do that. You guys take money and you don't sell their information. You don't give it to other lists. They are not getting constant emails. You send periodic updates to keep them in the loop, but they're not hassling, hassled by anyone else because you haven't sold their info. And I can't tell you how much everyone appreciates that. Uh, It seems obvious and clearly it is not. Today's pod is brought to you by Green Chef. It's not even the cooking that's really the problem. It's the thinking and the shopping. I want to eat healthy. I want to feed my family well. But most of the time, I just wish I could give everyone toast, which is why it's awesome when I have Green Chef in my fridge. Whether you're trying to eat for your whole body, looking out for gut-friendly recipes or clean eating, Green Chef is the number one meal kit for a reason. Maybe you want to branch out in your eating, but you don't know how. Each week, Green Chef gives you 80 plus options to choose from with seasonally inspired recipes and farm fresh ingredients. They even offer a green market with high quality, carefully curated foods like grab and go breakfasts, brunch kits, 10 minute lunches, and ready to eat snacks. So whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just looking to eat better, Green Chef makes it easy and offers you a range of recipes to suit your preferences. So why not give Green Chef a try? Right now, you can get 60% off by going to greenchef.com slash 60politicsgirl and using the code 60politicsgirl to get 60% off plus 20% off for your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60politicsgirl and use the code 60politicsgirl for 60% off plus 20% off the next two months. There's a reason Green Chef is called the number one meal kit for eating well. Find out for yourself today. If the refrigerator revolutionized food storage and the dishwasher revolutionized food cleanup, Lomi revolutionizes food waste. So what is a Lomi? Lomi is the world's first smart waste appliance that cuts your trash in half by transforming your food scraps into nutrient-rich plant food. 
If you listen to this show, you know I love this machine. All the food that goes to waste in your house, all the leftovers, all the things that die in your crisper drawer, instead of going into a landfill, you can turn that food waste into plant food. In just four hours, Lomi transforms almost everything you eat into nutrient-rich plant food with the push of a button. It cuts your trash in half, eliminates bugs and odors in your kitchen. And if you want to, you can feed it to your lawn or garden as an all-natural fertilizer that you created with your own food. Plus, Lomi promises you the very best possible experience, which is why they're one of the only kitchen appliances that has a full, no questions asked lifetime warranty on all their devices. And when you purchase a continued subscription, you automatically get upgraded to a new Lomi device every three years. Honestly, once I found out that food waste made up a huge portion of my family's personal carbon footprint, I was thrilled to reduce the amount of garbage I sent to a landfill. We want to do our part for the planet, and this is such an easy way to do yours. So whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash politics girl and use the promo code politics girl to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash politics girl and use the promo code politics girl at checkout. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash politics girl and use the promo code politics girl at checkout. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. You guys created such a cool product. Support for today's episode comes from OneSkin. It's the new year, and it's time to focus on self-care, and that means taking care of our skin's appearance and health. OneSkin makes it easy with their science-backed approach to healthier skin. I've just started using their topical supplement for eyes. I have very sensitive skin, and I haven't changed one thing about my skin routine for years but I'm getting older and the lines around my eyes are getting crepier, so I was ready to try something new. One Skin products are powered by a scientifically proven peptide called OS1. OS1 targets fine lines and wrinkles right where they start, which is in our cells. So as One Skin points out, this isn't just a skincare routine, it's a science breakthrough. OS1 is the first of its kind to actually turn back the clock rather than just masking the signs of aging. One Skin has combined tissue engineering, data analysis, and cutting edge longevity science to create the world's most effective product to target skin aging. One Skin believes the purpose of skincare is not just to improve how we look, but to optimize our skin's biology so it's more resilient to the aging process. It's next level skincare. And I thought, yeah, sign me up. So if you're interested, OneSkin has a full line of face, eye, body, sun, and travel products. They're not just promising healthier skin, they're proving it. OneSkin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, OneSkin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Honestly, who doesn't want that? So join me and get started today with 15% off by using the code politicsgirl at oneskin.co. That's 15% off at oneskin.co with the code politicsgirl. And after you purchase, when they ask you how you heard about them, please support the show and tell them we sent you. New, healthier skin. That's oneskin. Oneskin.co. I could talk about the, the email issue all day. Uh, I hear from people literally <laughs> we every all single could. day. It's just, it's just unbelievable. And I, and it's really people who are so committed to electing Democrats, who are so committed to this work, who are just so over it. And I think they're, you know, some are changing their email addresses like you, some are declaring email bankruptcy, and some it's actually leading to some real choice paralysis of like, I don't know who to give to anymore. Who is this random person? I don't have time to research them. So Yes to everything that you just said. And I think that's uh, part of why, even before I started working at Swing Left, I gave through Swing Left to candidates because I found it to be a much better experience. But I actually think there's a, it's, a bigger, it's a bigger thing than just the emails. And that is that uh, we really believe that whether for the short-term solutions for our democracy of sort of keeping Donald Trump way the hell out of the White House and protecting our democracy, which is in real crisis right now, or that long-term work that we're talking about. The only way that we win, short and long-term, is if we've got partners year-round and long-term all across the country, people who do not work in politics full-time, but who volunteer and who donate. And those are like the true heroes of uh, the wins that we had in 2018, the wins we had in 2020, the wins that everyone said were impossible in 2022, and yet we scored some real big wins in 2022. 
and also the wins in 2023, an odd year where usually people don't really participate. But as we've talked about, we had critical elections in Wisconsin and Ohio and Virginia and all this critical work. Those wins were literally only possible because of grassroots volunteers and donors, period, full stop. And grassroots volunteers and donors got credit in 2018 as the kind of heroes of that story. I feel like every news article is featuring an, an inspirational volunteer. But those volunteers and donors have not been getting credit since then. And I think that's a real travesty. And something that we really believe in is we don't want to spam people with emails, not just because it's really annoying, but also because in a real partnership, if grassroots volunteers and donors are the partners in this fight, we need to treat them like partners. We cannot treat them like ATM machines and we can't treat them like morons. I mean, a lot of these folks come to us and they feel like they're being they're being talked down to. And that is, to me, mind boggling because it's like some of our volunteers are some of the most sort of badass, inspirational people who teach us stuff every single day. And uh, there's one volunteer that we've got uh, in New Jersey who I'm obsessed with, who basically she was like, you know, I used to be the person in my friend group who would tell my friends about all the like local sales and like where to get the best discounts. So I've got a lot of trust with my friends. They trust what I'm talking about because I've like saved them a bunch of money and the stuff that they want to go buy and whatever. That's an organizing skill. She's got, she can turn out people, you know, in the dozens on short notice because she's got real community. That is a talent. That is a skill that has been cultivated not in politics, in her other life in the suburbs of New Jersey, that she's now translating into her organizing. And if we don't take that seriously and we don't sort of leverage those talents and those skills that people have in amazing amounts, then we're going to keep losing elections. And so anyway, that's my, my long way of saying we cannot treat people uh, like ATM machines, et cetera, not just because it's not the right thing to do, but also because we have to win and winning will require all hands on deck, not just for 2024, but all hands on deck that keep staying on for the cycles ahead, because this is a really long term fight. I mean, there's a reason that they talk about the morale in wars. You know, you have to right. keep the morale up. I mean, it might right. not be true of my audience, who I believe are incredibly motivated and action oriented, as you said, but I, I'm sure you're finding that there's a fair amount of people who volunteered in, say, 2018 and 2020 who kind of fell off. And maybe that has something to do with Trump himself not being in office right now. I'm hoping that with him officially on the ballot as the presidential candidate with his 91 felony charges and his inability to speak and is like hatred of everyone that isn't him will motivate people again. But, yes. but you know, like we need people to not only keep coming back to volunteer and keep their spirits up, but we need them to bring, like you said, 10 of their friends that might not be into politics yes. because clearly you've been able to achieve amazing results even as the numbers get smaller and the volunteers, you know, go in and out of interest. But we need to be doing even more than ever. And it's concerning that with the threats to our democracy being as high as they are, that people might be burnt out now because that is exactly what the Republicans and these conservatives and these really, yes. really big money groups want from us. They want us exhausted. That's why they hit us with just a fire hose of bad news, fire hose of bad behavior, constant, constant, constant until we're like, oh, I can't. I'm exhausted. I, how, how long am I supposed to fight back? You're like, well, you have to fight back for at least another year. And then hopefully, I always say, let's just keep the country's head above water. Just keep the country's head above water. And then we can really start to make real change. But this year, you got to freaking keep swimming. Totally. I mean, all of that resonates so much. And, and I think two thoughts on that. One is something really interesting that we, and kind of looking at the numbers of how did, how does volunteer behavior shifted over time? It's, we're just not in the same moment as we were in 2018. In 2018, it's sort of sure. like we were the, the best built bucket out in a rainstorm, right? Like Swing Left was holding up buckets and volunteers and donors were just pouring in, right? Like it was just every single person that I knew did something in the 2018 cycle and many times for the very first time. And we didn't have to find them. We just literally had to make sure that their energy was going toward the right races. And it was a really kind of viral moment and cycle. And we all felt that. And 2020 was weird. It was, you know, a year of COVID and lockdown and a lot of personal crisis and not getting out there uh, in the same way. And then there was 2022, um, which was 
its own weird thing. And, and candidly, you know, we started the 2022 cycle really worried about volunteerism. We were really, the numbers were really low. People were not signing up for canvassing. They weren't signing up. They were sort of like freaked out by canvassing. They hadn't been out of their houses for a really long time. They weren't phone banking at the beginning of the cycle. And we were worried that, you know, maybe all of the things that we believe in at the core of who we are of investing in grassroots, maybe there was something bad going on and we, you know, our model wasn't going to work in 2022. And what ended up happening was when the Dobbs decision came down as the, the crisis that we all can remember vividly, the entire dynamic with our volunteers shifted. And all of a sudden we saw sign up levels matching 2018 behaviors um, and those those numbers stayed. And so we looked at the end of the cycle. And of course, we won in the ways that everyone said were impossible. Uh, we lost the House by such a small margin of those 6,675 votes. And all of that was every cable news station. Everyone was saying that wasn't going to happen. So we looked at the numbers and we said, you know, we started out this cycle real nervous. We ended the cycle tremendously inspired and also feeling really vindicated, honestly, that like, Grassroots are still kicking ass in huge ways that's winning. But we looked at the numbers and the behaviors were different, right? So 2018, every single person just did one or two things, right? Some people did a lot more than that, but everyone, it was all hands on deck. 2022, we ended up doing the same amount of work. So same number of doors knocked and calls made and letters written in aggregate than compared to 2018. But it was a smaller number of people I'm sure a lot of them are your listeners who were just relentless that cycle. So rather than doing one weekend of canvassing, they were doing 15 weekends of canvassing rather than phone banking once a week, they were phone banking three days a week, whatever the case may be. And all of that work collectively had the same impact as 2018 in a really inspiring way. And I say all of that to say it is so natural in this cycle going into 2024 to feel the kind of doom and gloom, right? Like, as you said, by design, we are, we have been made to be exhausted. We have been made to feel like nothing is possible. And also it's sort of like, here we go again, it's Trump and Biden. And for some folks, that's just kind of annoying. For some folks, they kind of wish it was a different matchup for whatever reason. Um, And for us, I think the thing that's really important is We want to learn from the different dynamics of 2022 of investing in the kind of back to basics of our core volunteers did 70 percent of our volunteer shifts in 2022 and in 2023. Huge amounts of work. That's very different from 2018. So we're investing in them and making sure they've got the tools, the resources to keep doing huge stuff. And we've got to figure out how to kind of reimagine where we're taking those buckets to capture the rain, right? Of sort of where are people in a different moment now and how do we find them early, like now in January? So even if they only do one thing this cycle, even if they donate once or they knock on doors the weekend before the election, we're finding them now and starting those conversations now because we don't have time and money to waste, but also we need folks to sort of like, we want to acknowledge it's a different moment. It's okay if the vibes feel a little more weird than they did in 2018. That doesn't mean that the stakes are any lower. They certainly are not. Uh, and we still need everybody to do their part, even if their part is really, really small. Collectively, it'll add up uh, to, again, that sort of giant ocean of uh, of collected water that we, it's, a, it's becoming a very weird metaphor, but you know what I mean, of of what we need to make sure that we're, uh, we're going <laughs> to- I'm going to take your metaphor. I'm going to say, we're going to take that huge bucket of water and we're going to throw it on the witch that is the Republican party yeah, and she's yeah, going to go exactly, like, melting, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm melting. Because that's the thing, they have to be destroyed. It has to be done. This evil yes. flying monkey bullshit that we are listening to every day, it's got to be over. And I know you guys are also, you're talking about being back to basics. I know you're also doing something called Team Up and Crash Course programs yes. that seem like they're focusing on college age students, which is exactly yes. where I I think we need to be. We need the new voters. I don't think we need to be spending all of our time trying to turn mega voters. They're over here for now. We need to be all these new young people that are coming up, all these new young people that are going to be the ones who deal with all of the rights that are lost and all of these futures that are going to be destroyed, the destruction of the planet, everything. 
unless they want to live in some corporate funded white nationalist Christian land, then they need to be coming out. And I love that you're focusing on that. You want to tell me about these team up crash course programs you're using or, you know, the surge voter that you're thinking of. Tell me a little bit about that so people can feel like, oh, you got some plans. You got some plans. Yes. Um, So the team up program is our investment in how do we grow those volunteer led groups that are literally 70 percent of the work that happens on the doors, on the phones, those groups. A lot of those groups started in 2018 and they've continued doing amazing work. But what happens if a couple of those group leaders move or get tired or have a kid or a grandkid or whatever? And so Team Up is our investment in how do we not just infuse those groups with what they need to keep doing the amazing work they've relentlessly been doing since 2018, but also how do we build new ones in the places where we didn't build a group in 2018? We've got a lot of people on our email list who click on stuff, who participate individually, but how do we get them together in person to really become a community of action takers. And so we did a pilot in 2023 in Richmond, uh, Virginia, Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, and then in Queens, New York. And we saw that doing that, this is a radical concept, but organizing in the most essential ways, meeting people online, bringing them together in person, giving them the tools they need to then go take action on their closest competitive elections, Secret is it still works. It didn't, it has not lost its salience. It's not lost its magic. It just requires doing the work. And in 2024, we'll be expanding that program uh, starting in a handful of cities, uh, including uh, Phoenix, Arizona, for the obvious reasons of what we just talked about, um, and, uh, and a few other cities as well. And then we'll be expanding over the course of the cycle so that we're ending the 2024 cycle, not just with a whole bunch of amazing volunteers, but also with the infrastructure for those volunteer groups to continue onto the fights in 25 and 26. Now, there's a corollary program to that called Crash Course, as you rightly said, which is the same thing, but on college campuses. And as we know, college campuses are real different from communities where people live long term because college students graduate and they leave for the summer and they do all sorts of stuff. So we've just hired a whole bunch of amazingly talented, inspirational organizers on campuses around the country. Uh, A lot of these are in places where there's a lot of colleges and there's very little investment in young people because they're not, the campuses are not in the swing district or in the swing state, they're adjacent to it. So think about a place like, you know, Washington, DC, we've got American University, we've got Georgetown, we've got all these amazingly talented superstar students. We've got Virginia 20 minutes away. How do we make sure that those students are are getting active on those campuses and going and knocking on doors and and doing all the things that we need to win in Virginia? And I think something that we've observed yeah, talking is, to their peers, you know, like connecting with people they exactly. know, their own age group, this kind of thing. It's marvelous. Exactly, exactly. And if we want to win long term, we have to invest in those young people now. Not just so we win the elections. They're talking to their peers. They're talking about what's at stake but also so that these are the people who are going to end up running the Democratic Party. These are the people who are going to found organizations like Swing Left. We've got to find that talent and invest in it and make sure that organizing is getting iterated on year after year by those amazing folks doing great stuff. So we're I'm really, really inspired by uh, what they're already doing. And also just a, a quick anecdote. Our, uh, our campus organizers at Yale ended up doing, they've been going out and knocking on doors with our uh, swing left group in New York city called target majority. And it's sort of this amazing fusion of the college students are like, we can get all our friends to come out on the doors, but we don't have cars. The folks in New York are like, well, we can get the cars. We just want to not just be the same old folks going the same weekend, you know, the same group going over and over and over. So they're also partnering together in a really important way of in an all hands on deck moment, we've got to invest in everybody and make sure that young people are going out talking to young people. Some older folks are out, you know, talking to those swing voters, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and we're doing it in coordination with the resources that everybody has in a complimentary way. So smart. I, I like, I just love that you guys are big believers in elections being year round work, right? We can't just dial in right before an election and expect to make big change. Big change happens with long-term work, long-term effort. Like you're saying, teaming up with people, doing things like putting people with cars with people with people who don't have cars to talk to young people. Like it's just, it's smart 
forward, big picture thinking that we've needed all the way along. So how do people get involved? How do they help you defeat this extremist Republican Party that is well on track to destroy the country as we know it? If we let them, how do they help you? How do they get involved? So uh, it is couldn't be easier. They go to swingleft.org and all they need to do is sign up. Sign up now. Make that commitment now. Even if you're not sure what your budget is or how much time you've got, just make that commitment now, today. Uh, and then you can decide whether it's now or later what your budget is. And maybe that budget is financial. Maybe that budget is time. Like I, I got a call from uh, my neighbor three doors down who said, she and her husband had been talking. They can commit 30 minutes a week between now and election day to do something. And they ask, you know, what is that something? And they, it can only be at, uh, at 8 p.m. after their uh, toddler is asleep. But 30 minutes a week, they can do that. And then the weekend before the election, they want to go out and knock on doors and leave their daughter with their parents, right? That's an amazing commitment. And so they're now writing letters yeah. every single night, every single, excuse me, week for 30 minutes. And they're going to write... Over the course of this election cycle, they're going to write a ton of letters and then they'll canvas for that one weekend. So the question is not that all of us need to upend our lives. Everyone has different constraints, whether financial, whether time, whether logistical. Just commit to what you can commit to. We will be the guide to make sure that whatever you're able to commit to is going to uh, the most efficient place in terms of getting us to Democratic majorities. But everybody's got to do their part, uh, whether that part is big, small, or, or somewhere in between. Uh, and we're really excited to be partners with so many of your listeners already and can't wait to meet more of them. I know. I mean, listen, I'm sure everyone would love to take a break from politics, but that only works if our democracy is safe and we can trust that our representatives are going to take care of us. And for now, that's not remotely true. So as you've said before, even if things were going perfectly, you know, even if things were perfect, continued civic education and civic engagement is essential if we want our government to actually represent us and actually be reflective of our needs and the things that we want. You know, we always say that de democracy is not a spectator sport and we all have to play. So I hope they will go to swingleft.org and really see what they can do, whether that's 30 minutes a week, an hour a week, money, whatever it is, we can all do something because we got to play. We got to play in this game and we got to play to win. That's right. Thank you for all that you do. Thanks for lifting up our work and uh, and really proud to be in this fight together. So thank you. Uh, thank you for joining me today, Yasmin. I'm absolutely crazy about you. I think your organization is top flipping notch. And I just hope everyone uh, finds a way in to the, uh, the whole election season through you guys. Thank you so much. We got we got a lot we got a lot of winning to do. So uh, so can't wait to get started. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Yasmin Raji, executive director for Swing Left, who is building a lasting culture of incredibly successful grassroots participation by looking at our elections through a lens of competitiveness and respect. It is about the math that we need to win and the respect that we need to give our volunteers and donors to keep them in the fight. We have to win it all this year, and we don't have a second or a dollar to waste. Swing Left has done the research and built the infrastructure to be nimble and maneuverable when others cannot. If you want to stop the growing extremism that you are seeing in this country, then you want to get involved now. Decide what you have to offer, and Swing Left will help you to decide what to do with it. This is it, my friends. It's all on the line, but we can do this. There are truly more of us who believe in democracy and civil rights and fairness than there are who would take it away from us. We just have to beat them. I want to thank Yasmin for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go to swingleft.org and start making a difference. Until next week, PGF. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.